One of the most common questions that people ask me is, Igor, what's the best opening for black against white's first move pawn to e4? And the opening that I recommend often to people, especially beginners, is the French defense. And you may wonder, why not pushing the pawn forward to e5, the most common move? Well, e5, of course, is the main line, but the drawback of playing e5 is that you gotta be ready to face a lot of different attacking openings gambits by white. The thing here is the weakest point of your position is this pawn on f7, which is only covered by the king and is the quickest way for white to create powerful attackers to attack this pawn. And they can do it in a variety of different ways. They can bring their bishop out to c4 in the bishop's opening, or they can also follow up with knight f3 going to g5, the threat liver attack. They can play f4, the king's gambit, sometimes all kinds of d4 central gambits and whatnot. There's really like a ton of good attacking systems for white here, so you need to know quite a lot of theory there. Now, when you play pawn to e6, you shut it down instantaneously. There is just no attack whatsoever, at least in an opening, and you're perfectly fine. Moreover, on the next move, you play pawn to d5, and you completely blockade this diagonal, and you cover your king with this barrier, which makes it impossible for your opponent to possibly develop the bishop here and create any kind of quick attacks. Now, of course, you do need to know a little bit of theory, but what I also love about this opening is that there is a way to play it without knowing much, just by knowing the system that I'm about to share with you today in this video. Now, there are a couple ways for white to deal with this attack to their pawn, and we're gonna talk about the rest of the options later, but for now, let's stick to the main variation knight to c3, which is the strongest move of white that defends the pawn and also puts some pressure to your center. Now, the main lines here consists with like a lot of theory, and that's why I don't recommend that you go there. There is an easier line called the Fort Knox variation, which I recommend. You first just trade here on e4, and after that, you solve the main problem, and really the only problem of the French defense, it is a passive light squared bishop. Because of this pawn on e6, you can't bring your bishop out easily, and this is a little bit of a drawback of the French defense. But you can solve this problem right away. And you do that by going bishop d7, relocating your bishop to c6 to this active diagonal. From there, it's going to attack this knight on e4, and then down the road, it's going to put pressure onto white's casting as they're likely to castle there. And as white plays some move, knight of 3 for instance, you play bishop c6, attacking this knight and putting your bishop to this active diagonal. By the way, this whole variation is completely safe by black. It's a very solid line used by grandmasters, but it works against amateurs just as well. Now, black white needs to do something about this knight. In most cases, they play bishop d3, a natural developing move. And now you play knight to d7, which is also a standard move by black here. Without this knight, white could possibly try to jump forward on e5 and target your bishop on c6 with their knight. But now you cover the square, and so you don't worry about white jumping there. So that's why we want our knight to stand there. White does something, let's say they castle, and you play knight to f6. Another beauty of this system, the Fort Knox variation that I'm sharing, is that you just play the same moves no matter what white does, which makes it very easy for you to learn it. Just after watching this video, you will know this line, and guess what, most of your opponents have zero idea about what to do here. Now, with knight f6, you develop a knight, plus you attack this knight twice. Therefore, white needs to make a decision about what to do with it. Of course, white can go back, but it looks passive, and so in most cases they'll try to either take here or maybe go bishop g5, which looks sometimes even more aggressive, but we're gonna cover all of these options so you'll know what to do. The easiest way for white, which seems to be the easiest, is just to trade off the knight on f6. And they expect you to recapture with the other knight from d7, because normally in an opening it is not advisable to bring your queen out, as the queen can be attacked. But in this case, we have a little trick in mind. You actually recapture with a queen, creating some unpleasant threats to white. So you threaten bishop takes f3, which will ruin their pawn structure, creating a bunch of weaknesses, plus your king is actually targeting this pawn on d4. So after you eliminate their knight, you can go ahead and pick up this weak pawn on d4. And it starts feeling unpleasant by wife all of a sudden. He thought that he's having a good position here, but now he's facing some unpleasant troubles. But white may be tempted to play bishop g5, as at first your opponent will be really happy once he finds out that there is a move bishop g5, as it looks like your queen is just trapped and it's time for you to resign. But the truth is right the opposite. It's time for white to resign after you play bishop takes a 3 counter in their queen, and you just win a piece along this variation. So, so not only you grab their queen, just like they do, but you also grab this knight along the way, which just makes a difference, and that's why at the end of the line, if we just keep taking everything, you can see that you've got two minor pieces versus one, meaning you've got an extra knight, 
And since it's an endgame and your opponent has no attack, you should have no problems converting your extra piece. So in the main position, that covers knight takes f6, all of a sudden you jump out with your queen, putting some unpleasant pressure on white. Quite a, many of your opponents will play a bishop g5, looks like an aggressive option, so they don't want to defend, they pin your knight down to the queen, they put pressure, looks cool. In fact, it's also run for white. That's why I also love this variation. I mean, I actually learned it the hard way. I once faced this Fort Knox variation as white and I lost the game and I didn't know anything about it. So after that, I checked the variation. It turned out to be that it's pretty cool. And then I learned it and started using it as black. So you can try the same thing. Now, Bishop G5, very counterintuitive to understand that it's run by white. Now, you play Bishop E7, neutralizing this pin so that, you know, now you're totally safe. And what's good for you is that actually you don't mind trading off some pieces. You lack space a little bit, so it's a little bit awkward for you to have all these pieces. You slightly lack breathing space to move, and therefore, if you clear the space, if you trade off some of your pieces, it makes it easier for you. So, as he starts trading off, you say, okay, you're welcome, bishop takes, now you target this bishop together with your queen, so he recaptures, and then, guess what, you do the same thing. All of a sudden, you jump out with your queen, creating all the threats we're already aware of. You put pressure to the knight, as well as to this pawn on d4, and somehow it gets uncomfortable for white to handle this thing. Uh, I believe the most common move by white here is playing pawn to c3, trying to guard this pawn on d4, but then you can execute your main threat, bishop takes f3, ruining their pawn structure. It's better for white to trade queens off, because if they just open up their king and leave queens on the board, their king is going to be really vulnerable to your future attack. So it's better for white to trade off queens. Now, you ruin their pawn structure, but at least in an endgame, it's harder for you to attack their king. But you can attack his weak pawns. And although the position looks fine for white, it can get bad really quickly. For example, after you move your queen away, what it also allows you to do is to possibly castle queenside, which sometimes is really nice. And now after white plays, some move doesn't really matter. You want to basically get to all these weak pawns. And in order to do that, you need to open up some files. So you play pawn to c5, wanting to trade off and create another weak pawn for white there. He takes there, you recapture. Now it's really handy for you to have this rook along the eight open file. It already starts creating some, some threats. Plus the knight is attacking the bishop as well. And after he moves the bishop somewhere, we can enter the home rank, start putting pressure to all these pawns, and it'll stack rooks along the d file. And although it's an end game, white's position is actually lost here, just because you can attack all these weaknesses and white has nothing to oppose. All right, let's go over the main line once again, just so that you also remember these variations better. After you played pawn to d5, attacking this pawn, the main line by white is knight to c3. Then you trade pawns in the center, simplifying matters for you. And after knight to e4, you solve your main problem, this passive bishop, by relocating it to a better square c6, where you attack this knight on e4. As white defends it, you then play a preparatory move knight to d7, which possibly makes it easier for you to play knight f6 and also covers the square e5 so that your opponent cannot jump there himself. Then your opponent plays something, you play knight f6, attacking this knight twice, posing some questions to white of what he's gonna do. And it's a really tricky position because the best move by white, just a little bit of a spoiler, is knight to g3, and the second best move by white recommended by computer is a weird looking knight to d2. But all this stuff is really counterintuitive and like, it's very unlikely that your opponents will play something like this because it all looks passive and bad. Much more often they'll take here, which is bad, or go bishop g5, which is bad, or defend the knight, which is also quite fine for you. Anyway, let's go once again into this bishop g5 variation. If he pins your knight, you just neutralize it with your own bishop. As he starts trading, you're fine with that, you're actually okay with trading off some pieces, now you have much more freedom of maneuver for the remaining pieces that you have. With queen coming off to f6, you attack this knight on f3, as well as this pawn on d4, which creates some problems for white. c3 is actually wrong, as it allows you to take on f3, ruin their pawn structure, and you get an edge. The best move for white is just to humble themselves and to play bishop e2, just dropping the bishop back and playing defense. Now after that you can castle queenside, I quite like it, because although castling kingside is perfectly fine as well, but from d8 your rook is actually starts putting some pressure onto white on this d4 pawn x ray in the queen, and it can be useful for you to, for your middle game attack. And if white plays something like pawn to c3, you have a nice variety of options. You can choose to attack on the king side with, you know, pushing pawns forward, your bishop is always great standing there, and you can just keep pushing pawns, so that's one plan. Or the other plan of yours is to make use of this active rook and you can strike in the center with pawn to e5 trying to make use of your active rook. Now if they trade off, then the d file will be open. It's quite unpleasant for white. 
if they try to push forward, then you don't have to worry about your bishop because you can actually make use of your active rook and pin this pawn down to the queen. Plus, the pawn is actually attacked now by your rook and bishop. If he tries to defend it, you know, the pawn is still pinned, so you don't have to worry about it. You can push forward, e4, attacking his knight. If it jumps forward, all of a sudden you have a little combo that wins a couple of these central pawns. Bishop takes d5, you clear the d file for your rook, and now because the knight has pinned down to the queen, on the next move you're gonna take it, attack the queen, or take it with a queen and trade off queens, and you just have two extra pawns and a winning position. Going back to the main line, it's actually quite counterintuitive for white to realize that the best thing they can do is to move the knight back to g3. Again, those tempting options, knight to f6 or bishop to g5, actually backfire and somehow helps black to develop their own attack. So what if your opponent goes knight to g3? Well, that doesn't create any problems for you because it's a passive defensive move, they just retreat. So you have no problems and you just continue your development. And you can play a bishop e7, castle and your position is rock solid. There's not much white can do and it's just a normal game of chess. If they try to jump forward with knight e5, which is probably the only attacking attempt they can possibly do, knight to e5, trying to put pressure to your bishop, it looks advantageous to white, as if you trade off the knights, they start attacking your knight, and white starts fantasizing about their possible attack on the king side, but you shut down those fantasies with queen to d5 counter. And your bishop on c6 is actually doing a great job in creating this threat of queen takes g2, plus this pawn on e5 is handy. So they have to cover the diagonal so that they're not checkmated. As they do so, they lose this pawn on e5 and you are up a pawn with all the other advantages of your position. White is passive, they have nothing to do. You can castle king side, put in your rook to this open file. You can push your pawn on the king side with h5, h4 attacking this knight. So life's good. All right, finally, what if your opponent is super solid? He does everything right, he knows all the theory, he does not create any weaknesses, he's Caruana and he plays rook to e1 just defending this knight, not falling for any tricks. Well, then, again, if your opponent plays normal moves, you can just do the same and finish your development. So you play bishop e7 and you castle. Your opponent plays something, let's say pawn c3 to solidify his center, you castle, life's good, you avoided any opening disasters, you finish the development, everything's fine. Say he goes bishop f4. So what's your middle game plan then? One of the common ideas for you is actually to trade off some pieces. We talked about this earlier, that when you're lacking space and you can't move the queen out, you know, your knight is kind of can't move forward, it's actually good to trade off material, creating more breathing space for the rest of your pieces. Also, this bishop on c6 is actually gives you an option to trade it off against one of white's knights. If it ever feels uncomfortable that your opponent can attack you somehow, jump forward with one of his knights, you can always trade off your bishop and shut down his attack before he can even launch it. So you can actually take there on e4 and trade off a bunch of material there. Life's good. Now you can go knight f6 and gain a tempo attack in this rook so that you relocate your knight to a better square. And after the rook comes back, there are two very common things for you to do. One is to play in the rock solid facet where you play pawn to c6. You follow the positional rule which says that once you trade it off a light square bishop, it makes sense for you to put your pawns on light squares so that your remaining bishop has a lot of open diagonals to move around. And with this, kind of pawn setup, it's just really difficult for your opponent to move forward and to attack you anyhow, again, you're just rock solid. Or you can be more active and instead of playing pawn to c6, you can play pawn to c5, a little bit more active move and objectively actually a better move. Because now you want to just trade off on d4 and after that, white has no space advantage and just no advantage at all, the position becomes equal. By the way, the fact that the position is equal does not mean that you can't win, because very often if your opponents cannot attack your king, and currently there is no way for white to do that, they're completely clueless of what to do. They start playing like completely wrong moves and it's easy to outplay them if you just know a little bit of positional rules. By the way, if you are not sure how to play those kind of positions, it's already a middle game position, so it's a separate subject, I'd recommend that you check out my free masterclass about the positional chess right here, so that will show you those handy principles to rely on in those kind of positions. So that covers the main move knight to c3 and most challenging move for black, that's why I wanted to go in depth on that option. Besides that, white can also try to trade pawns or to move forward with pawn to e5. Those options are actually easier for you, they're less challenging. If they exchange on d5, they help you to solve your main problem, this passive bishop on c8, which cannot be developed. After you recapture, now the bishop is open and position becomes simple, symmetric, you just develop. And there is also a way for black to spice it up and to use a more aggressive setup, so I'll tell you in a moment what it is. And finally, if they play pawn to e5, 
Again, this releases the tension, it does not create any attack against you, and also these pawns are advanced, which is somewhat handy for you, because they're closer to your territory, so it's easier for you to attack them. And you can do that by playing c5, then knight to c6, queen to b6, possibly, and you start targeting all these pawns, which white pushed forward without sufficient protection from the rest of their army. Now, I've got another video where I cover these both variations in more details, so you can check it out right there, what to do if white either takes here or pushes this, you can check it out in that video and you'll be fully covered, and I'm sure you'll win lots of games with it.